Stop conflating communism and democratic socialism because it's unfair and inaccurate said the person who supportively sent me this Karl Marx video on YouTube. Rebuttal time, you bearded fat. <laughs> this one's by popular request because this Karl Marx video is a little old, but has enjoyed a second win specifically due to the Bernie Sanders supporters, as you will see in the comments section, despite the fact that they swear up and down, socialism and communism have nothing to do with each other. Let's get to it. Most people agree that we need to improve our economic system somehow. Yet we're also often keen to dismiss the ideas of capitalism's most famous and ambitious critic. Karl Marx. Straw man! Nobody dismisses him. Everybody who's read Karl Marx and understands economics doesn't like him. They're not dismissing him, they're listening to him saying, oh, you're an insane person, and deciding to go the other direction. This isn't very surprising. In practice, his political and economic ideas have been used to design disastrously planned economies and nasty dictatorships. Nevertheless, we shouldn't reject Marx too quickly. We ought to see him as a guide whose diagnosis of capitalism's ills helps us to navigate towards a more promising future. Capitalism is going to have to be reformed, and Marx's analyses are going to be part of any answer. Before we get to some details here, it's really important. This person is trying to present this as unbiased, but they're telling you that you ought to and should look to Karl Marx as a guide. They also say it has maybe been used for some bad regimes. Okay, let's flip that. Name me any good communist economies that have come from One. Let's start with one. Marx was born in 1818 in Trier in Germany. Soon he became involved with the Communist Party, a tiny group of intellectuals advocating for the overthrow of the class system and the abolition of private property. First off, how does anyone watch this, hear that, and not literally soil themselves. Abolition of private property. The thing you're watching this on, it's not yours. It belongs to this bearded guy. He worked as a journalist and had to flee Germany, eventually settling in London. Marx wrote an enormous number of books and articles, sometimes with his friend Friedrich Engels. Also a prick. Modern work is alienated. One of Marx's greatest insights is that work can be one of the sources of our greatest joys. But, in order to be fulfilled at work, Marx wrote that workers need to see themselves in the objects they have created. Think of the person who built this chair. It's straightforward, strong, honest and elegant. It's an example of how, at its best, labour offers us a chance to externalise what's good inside us. So right off the bat, let's break this down, using their example. A simple one. A chair. It was made by workers. That feels good. You made a chair. But what does it not account for? Innovation, creativity, risk, advancement, progress. This is why, and I'll prove this as a recurring theme, outside of some weapons created by government, no communist regimes or countries have been at the forefront of giant leaps in technology or innovation. Those gifts have never been given to the world through communism. Part of the problem is that modern work is incredibly specialized. Specialized jobs make the modern economy highly efficient, but they also mean that it's seldom possible for any one worker to derive a sense of the genuine contribution they might be making to the real needs of humanity. Marx argued that modern work leads to alienation, entfremdung. In other words, a feeling of disconnection between what you do all day and who you feel you really are and what you think you'd ideally be able to contribute to existence. Here's the crux of Marxism. Karl Marx and people who forward this focus entirely on the worker, specifically the labor worker. Here's the thing, the labor worker is not a synonym for humanity. Humanity as a whole also needs medicine, progress and efficiency, agricultural innovation, needs for humanity that cannot be met if the mere labor worker's importance is placed above all else. Modern work is insecure. Capitalism makes the human being utterly expendable, just one factor among others in the forces of production, and one that can ruthlessly be let go the minute that costs rise or savings can be made through technology. Here's where the wordplay is so important from the unbelievably biased presenter. They've now referred to workers as utterly expendable under a capitalist system. No! In a free enterprise system, your value is determined precisely by your contributing power, your skill sets, and your work ethic. You're the best engineer in the world? You're paid your worth. Under communism, you're not. Your contribution is worth the exact same as the guy next to you on the factory line who has no interest in contributing at all. I just stare at my desk, but it looks like I'm working. So while jobs may be legally barred from being deemed dispensable, guess what? Everything that makes you uniquely valuable as a human being is. It's entirely dispensable. You're a number. Yet, as Marx knew deep inside each of us, we don't want to be arbitrarily let go. We're terrified of being abandoned. 
Communism isn't just an economic theory. Understood emotionally, it expresses a deep-seated longing that we always have a place in the world's heart, that we will not be cast out. Oh, see, that sounds nice, right? Place in the world's heart. But what he just expressed is exactly why communism lends itself to mass murdering authoritarian regimes so perfect. You will pay your blood. Come here, I can't. You come here, where's my time? Can't believe it. Communism can only prey on fear and insecurity. Can capitalism? Sure, but it can only work if it simultaneously highlights the human desire to succeed, to progress, and to grow. Communism can only even be attempted with a scared and broken people. Capitalism, free enterprise, is most effectively embraced by optimistic ones. Workers get paid little while capitalists get rich. This is perhaps the most obvious qualm that Marx had with capitalism. In particular, he believed that capitalists shrink the wages of the labourers as much as possible in order to skim off a wide profit margin. He called this primitive accumulation, ursprüngliche Akkumulation. Whereas capitalists see profit as a reward for ingenuity and technological talent, Marx was far more damning. Profit is simply theft, and what you're stealing is the talent and hard work of your workforce. So, Karl Marx thinks that profit is theft. You know what he doesn't think is theft? Actual theft. I got robbed by a sweet old lady on a motorized cart. I didn't even see it coming. Example, I invent the light bulb. I've toiled away, creating thousands of failed prototypes, investing some of the best years of my life while other people ate, slept, and enjoyed life. Maybe we spent a little too much time puking off balconies. <laughs> but we had fun, huh? Yeah! Finally, I create a successful one, and it improves and saves billions of lives across the world. All because of an ingenious idea and work ethic. People across the world are willing to pay for my wonderful invention, and so I become wealthy. That's capitalism. According to Marxists, that's theft. Same situation. I invent the light bulb. Only government comes in and takes all of my profit at gunpoint. According to Marxists, that's not theft. Are you getting it yet? That's what communism is, and yes, even socialism, which is why all of the Bernie supporters can be found under this video liking it like it's hot. At the end of the day, it comes down to men with guns forcing you to give them your stuff. Be a good little fella now and open the door. So you wonder why not only communism lends itself to authoritarian regimes, but why leftism lends itself to more violent, disruptive protests like Black Lives Matter or Occupy Wall Street. It's because despite what hippies and democratic socialists tell you, at its core, communism and socialism, through its only available methods of collection and distribution, are predicated on the use of violent force. True capitalism and free enterprise require voluntary transactions. Communism and socialism require coercion. You will now, piss off, cut out Karl Marx. But I'm Crises are endemic to capitalism, and they're caused by something rather odd. The fact that we're able to produce too much, far more than anyone needs to consume. Capitalist crises are crises of abundance, rather than, as in the past, crises of shortage. Interesting that Karl Marx brought up shortages in the past, because after people followed his philosophy, these governments created the greatest shortages the modern world had ever seen in communist countries. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes American journalists talk about how bad a country is because people are lining up for food. That's a good thing. You go, you democratic socialist, you. I like this guy. Now, what he has said here is true. It is absolutely true. Most problems in a capitalist society are caused by that of overabundance. For example, we have an obesity problem here in the United States. We have such unfettered access to the widest variety of food the world has ever seen that, yeah, some people can choose to be fat. And it's an annoying problem in the United States. It results in broken scales, tight airplane seat squeezes, and Lena Dunham. Ah! In communist Russia, China, Cuba, North Korea, they have bread lines. Take your pick. None shall interfere. Do as you please. Our factories and systems are so efficient, we could give everyone on this planet a car, a house, access to a decent school and a hospital. And that's what so enraged Marx, but also made him so hopeful too. Few of us actually need to work because the modern economy is so productive. And how did those factories and hospitals become so efficient? See, giving away all of this stuff as Karl Marx wants to do through communism or socialism requires that it be done on the back of capitalism. Again, this channel wants you to believe that it's presenting its information as factual and not propaganda, which is important because this isn't a factual argument, but a moral one. 
But rather than seeing this need not to work as the freedom it is, we complain about it masochistically and describe it by a pejorative word, unemployment. We should call it freedom. There's so much unemployment for a good and deeply admirable reason, because we're so good at making things efficiently. We're not all needed at the coalface. But in that case, we should, thought Marx, make leisure admirable. We should redistribute the wealth of the massive corporations that make so much surplus money and give it to everyone. This is, in its own way, as beautiful a dream as Jesus' promise of heaven, but a good deal more realistic sounding. If you believe it's the government's job to encourage unemployment and leisure in place of productivity and innovation... Well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. By the way, while we're comparing leisure, which vacation would you rather take? <music> Silly communists. I guess it depends. The most leisurely activity Russians ever engaged in was defecting. I defect. You about ready to get maced. Oh my God, don't you get it? He's defecting. Capitalism is bad for capitalists. Marx didn't think that capitalists were evil. For example, he was acutely aware of the sorrows and secret agonies that lay behind bourgeois marriage. Marx argued that marriage was actually an extension of business, and that the bourgeois family was fraught with tension, oppression and resentment, with people staying together not for love, but for financial reasons. Marx believed that the capitalist system forces everyone to put economic interests at the heart of their lives, so that they can no longer know deep, honest relationships. He called this psychological tendency commodity fetishism, Waren fetishismus, because it makes us value things that have no objective value. He wanted people to be freed from financial constraint so that they could, at last, start to make sensible, healthy choices in their relationships. See, this is interesting because a lot of people don't realize just how anti-marriage and traditional family Karl Marx was. Granted, yes, marriage is one of the greatest indicators we have of economic stability, wealth, and growth. It's also the biggest indicator we have available for health, longevity, and personal happiness. Here's where contrast is so important. Whereas Karl Marx sought to destroy the traditional family, the founding fathers in the United States were emphatic about it being the central building block to the American way of life. Why? Because before a municipal, state, or federal government, you had a moral level of self-governance within the family. One that led to a happier and, as Karl Marx has pointed out, more financially productive society. And that's why many of our marriage laws exist in the books to begin with. The 20th century feminist answer to the oppression of women has been to argue that women should simply be able to go out to work. But Marx's answer was more subtle. This feminist insistence merely perpetuates human slavery. The point isn't that women should imitate the sufferings of their male colleagues. It's that men and women should have the permanent option to enjoy leisure. And this is why modern social justice warriors like feminists are so far to the left. Is there anything more appealing to troglodytes like Triglypuff than not getting married, which wasn't going to happen anyway, claiming that you're a strong woman while not working? <laughs> Karl Marx was creating his fan base early. In short, one of the biggest evils of capitalism is not that there are corrupt people at the top, this is true in any human hierarchy, but that capitalist ideas teach all of us to be anxious, competitive, conformist, and politically complacent. This is key, we'll get to the philosophy in a second, but I love how he skimmed over. Corruption at the top is seen in any hierarchy. It's a valid point, and one that unravels Karl Marx's central argument. Sure, in capitalism or free enterprise, there are no doubt some corrupt people at the top. In a true free enterprise system, that corruption is mitigated by the concept of competition. Now, invariably, when that corruption does occur, repeatedly and systematically, as you see with big banks, big energy, big unions, they can only do so when abetted by big government. Big banks are able to continually be corrupt. Why? Not because of capitalism, but because of a never-ending supply of big bailout funds from equally corrupt politicians. Now, at least you can still choose to use a local bank or credit union who never required bailouts to begin with. But let's change the scenario. The big corrupt government you and I both hate for bailing out big banks, now it is the bank. It is your only bank. It is also your only grocery store, your only phone provider, your only health insurance. That's communism. As seen with every communist regime ever, it leads to massive death and totalitarianism 
every time. So if this man and Karl Marx acknowledge that in any hierarchy you will find corruption at the top, why, oh why, would you want to hand over that top to a centralized government monopoly where no voluntary transactions are even necessary? Only the use of violent coercion. Marx was not a well-regarded or popular intellectual in his day. No, no, I can't imagine he was. He's not a respected intellectual today outside of your pot-smoking drum circle at college. Respectable, conventional people of Marx's day would have laughed at the idea that his ideas could remake the world. Yet, just a few decades later, they did. His writings became the keystone for some of the most important ideological movements of the 20th century. But Marx was like a brilliant doctor in the early days of medicine. He could recognize the nature of the disease, although he had no idea how to go about curing it. Yes, Karl Marx was central to some of the biggest ideological revolutions of this century. Here they are. Yes, that one was very good. Oh, I like that one too. Wait, rewind. Ah, I thought I saw myself for a second. At this point in history, we should all be Marxists in the sense of agreeing with his diagnosis of our troubles. But we need to go out and find the cures that really will work. And this is how it ends. We should all be Marxists, demanding conformity in place of intellectual diversity and telling us exactly how to think. Well, how Marxist of you. Hey, if you like this video, subscribe by hitting my face or the button that says subscribe or watch one of these videos playing in a box next to me. If you didn't like this video, you're going to have to pay me anyway. That's how communism works.